On December 23rd, 2025, a Beechcraft K-35 Bonanza departed Susanville, California on a private cross-country flight. Approximately one hour later, that aircraft was found crashed in remote terrain near Pole Butte, Oregon. This was a fatal accident, and it is currently under investigation. In this video, we're going to focus on what is confirmed so far. We'll talk about the airplane involved, the route that was flown, and later on, the flight tracking data that's available. Just as importantly, we'll also talk about what this information does not tell us. The aircraft involved in this accident was a Beechcraft K-35 Bonanza, manufactured in 1959. The Bonanza family occupies a very specific place in general aviation. These airplanes were designed from the beginning as efficient, fast, personal transportation. They were not built as trainers, and they were not meant to be for giving instructional platforms. They were designed to go places. The K-35 is a high-performance, single-engine piston aircraft. It features retractable landing gear, a constant speed propeller, and an aerodynamic airframe optimized for cruise efficiency. Even by modern standards, it is a relatively fast airplane for its category. That design intent matters because performance always comes with trade-offs. At cruise, a Bonanza operates at speeds that are significantly higher than what most pilots experience in basic training aircraft. That means things happen faster, distances close more quickly, decisions need to be made earlier, and deviations, whether in airspeed, altitude, or configuration, can compound more rapidly if they're not managed deliberately. This isn't a criticism of the airplane. It's simply an operational reality. Aircraft like the Bonanza reward preparation, planning, and discipline. They are very capable when operated within their design envelope, and they are widely respected for their performance and efficiency. At the same time, they demand accuracy, they do not offer the same margins for casual flying that slower, simpler aircraft do. Another important point here is workload. In a retractable gear, constant speed propeller airplane, the pilot is managing more systems. Configuration changes matter. Energy management matters. And in dynamic environments, that workload can increase quickly. None of that implies error, and none of it implies a deficiency. It simply sets the stage for understanding what kind of airplane this was and what kinds of operational demands it places on the person flying it. It's also worth addressing age, because it often comes up. This airplane was built in 1959. That does not, by itself, indicate anything about its condition or its airworthiness. Many aircraft of this vintage operate safely every day. What matters, and what investigators will examine, is maintenance history, inspection status, and compliance with applicable requirements. At this stage, we do not have that information, and we're not going to speculate about it. The key takeaway from the aircraft itself is straightforward. This was a capable, high-performance airplane designed for cross-country flight. It was operating in the role it was built for. Understanding that helps frame everything else we're about to look at. Now let's talk about the route and the environment in which this flight was taking place. The flight departed from Susanville, California and tracked generally northbound into southern Oregon. When you look at the flight path, what stands out immediately is how direct and purposeful it is. There's no evidence of wandering, no extended maneuvering, no circling or holding. This looks like a planned cross-country flight proceeding along a logical route toward its destination. That's an important observation because it tells us something about intent. Up to the point where the data ends, this does not appear to be a flight that was searching for a way through conditions or reacting to developing problems by changing direction repeatedly. Beneath that route, however, the environment is not forgiving. This portion of California and Oregon is high desert terrain. Elevations are significant. Population density is low. Airports are few and far between. And off-airport landing options are limited. From an operational standpoint, that means options are constrained. Even in good weather, remote terrain reduces flexibility. There are fewer places to divert and fewer benign surfaces available if something unexpected occurs. The terrain itself also plays a role in airflow. High desert regions with uneven terrain are known for mechanical turbulence and wind variability, especially when larger weather systems are present. Wind flowing over ridges and through valleys can change direction and velocity rapidly, even when surface conditions appear manageable. This does not require storms. It does not require extreme weather. It's simply a characteristic of flying over terrain like this. At this stage, there is no confirmed evidence of weather violations, and no indication that the flight was operating outside of any regulatory or planning limits. 
We don't yet have a full weather reconstruction at the aircraft's altitude, and that analysis will come later as part of the investigation. What we can say is that this was not a low-risk operating environment. Remote terrain raises the stakes, even during otherwise routine flights, and when we later look at flight tracking data, it's important to keep that environmental context in mind. Again, this is not about assigning cause, it's about understanding the setting. So far, what we have is a capable airplane on a planned cross-country route, operating over terrain that limits options and can produce complex airflow. Up to this point, everything fits within the profile of a normal private flight, one that simply happens to be operating in an environment that leaves little room for error. When we look at publicly available flight tracking, it's important to understand exactly what kind of data this is, and what it isn't. This information comes from ADS-B and GPS-based tracking. It's useful for building a general picture of a flight, but it's not a flight recorder. It does not tell us control inputs, engine parameters, pilot intent, or even actual airspeed. What it shows us is position, altitude, and ground speed over time. That distinction matters a lot. You'll notice the speed line fluctuates a lot especially in the latter part of the flight. It's tempting to think that means the airplane is speeding up and slowing down dramatically, but that's not what this data actually represents. This is ground speed, not airspeed, and ground speed is heavily influenced by wind. When an airplane flies through turbulent air, especially near weather systems and terrain, the wind component can change very quickly. A sudden headwind drop or tailwind burst will show up instantly as a speed change on this chart, even if the pilot hasn't touched the throttle. In other words, these swings do not automatically indicate aggressive maneuvering, power changes, or unstable flying. They often reflect what the air mass itself is doing. And in this part of the country, that's not a trivial factor. Southern Oregon and Northern California feature terrain that can significantly distort airflow. Even on days that don't look dramatic on a surface weather map, winds aloft interacting with ridges, plateaus, and basins can produce localized turbulence, shear, and rapidly changing wind components. What's important here is that the speed fluctuations line up with altitude disturbances. You don't see a clean, steady cruise profile. You see small climbs, descents, and adjustments happening alongside those speed changes. That tells us the airplane wasn't flying through smooth, stable air. It was dealing with a dynamic environment that increases workload and reduces margins. That doesn't mean anything went wrong in that moment but it does mean the pilot was not operating in a low-stress, set-it-and-forget-it cruise environment, and that context matters. Now, equally important is what this data does not show. We don't see a prolonged, stabilized descent that would suggest a planned approach into an airport. We don't see a clear diversion toward a nearby runway, and we don't see an extended emergency profile, such as a long, shallow descent consistent with troubleshooting or glide planning. That doesn't rule anything in or out. It simply tells us that based on the data available to the public, there is no obvious signature of a long-duration emergency response captured here. And that's where disciplined analysis stops. Because beyond this point, the data cannot speak for itself. This doesn't tell us the cause of the accident, but it does tell us the conditions were not benign, and that matters when we later talk about decision-making and safety margins. At this stage, we need to clearly separate confirmed information from unanswered questions. What we do know is fairly limited, but solid. We know the aircraft type and its performance class. A Beechcraft K-35 Bonanza is a capable, efficient cross-country airplane with systems that require active management. We know the general route of flight, a direct northbound track through sparsely populated terrain with limited diversion options. We know the broad operating environment, including terrain-influenced airflow and the potential for wind variability and we can observe general altitude and ground speed trends that suggest the airplane was flying in air that was not smooth or uniform, particularly later in the flight. What we do not know is far more extensive. We do not know the exact weather conditions at the aircraft's altitude along the route at the time of the accident. Surface observations don't always reflect what's happening a few thousand feet above the ground, especially in mountainous regions. We do not know the pilot's workload, decision-making process, or what they were seeing and feeling in the cockpit. We do not know the aircraft's mechanical condition at the time, whether there were any system issues, power anomalies, or control problems. And we do not know the sequence of events in the final moments, because flight tracking data simply isn't precise enough to tell that story. That's why accident investigations take time. Going forward, investigators will focus on several key areas. The wreckage examination will look for evidence of mechanical failure, 
control continuity, and impact characteristics. Weather reconstruction will attempt to rebuild the atmospheric conditions along the route and at the accident location, not just at the surface, but aloft. Maintenance records and operational history will help establish whether the aircraft was being operated within known limitations and whether any unresolved issues existed, and pilot records will provide context about experience, recent activity, and training, not to assign blame, but to understand exposure and workload. This is a methodical process, and it's designed to answer questions carefully, not quickly. Early data provides context, not conclusions. At this stage, what we're looking at is a normal cross-country flight operating in a complex environment, with changes occurring later in the flight that reflect increasing atmospheric variability. The tracking data gives us useful clues about the environment, but it does not tell us why the accident happened. As more information becomes available, the picture will become clearer. But for now, it's important to separate what the data shows from what it does not. And that discipline matters, because understanding accidents isn't about guessing early. It's about letting the evidence speak, in the right order, at the right time. When there's more to learn, we'll come back and take another look.